the life of the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Peace be upon him. A lecture series by Mufti Ismail ibn Musa Mink. Episode 5 Prophethood and Early Muslims Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send complete blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask the Almighty to bless all the messengers who were sent from the beginning Right at the beginning, the time of Adam alayhi salatu was salam, coming all the way down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah bless them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who struggled and sacrificed in order to protect the deen and to convey it to others in a way that today it has got to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and to grant us goodness. We are moving through the story of the life of the most blessed of creation, the final of messengers Muhammad. Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A point of clarification, I was asked a question earlier today regarding the well of Zamzam. The question was, we made mention of Abdul Muttalib having had the privilege to, to dig because he saw in his dream where the well was. When he dug it, it began to gush. So didn't we hear before that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam's time there was Hajar alayhi salatu was salam, the mother of Ismail, who was running between Safa and Marwa, and then the well began to gush? The answer is yes. That is when the well started. That is the first appearance of the water of Zamzam was at the time of Ismail alayhi salam, when he was a little child. But if you take a careful look, you will come to learn that after some time it was blocked because of the floods and because of various other reasons connected to the weather and so on. And what had happened thereafter is that at the time of Abdul Muttalib, it was made to gush forth once again. So this was the second time that the Zamzam had gushed. Now we are moving on to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he used to, as we said, see dreams and the following day it would be completely true. Whatever he saw was true. Why was this the beginning of prophethood or early signs? Because according to what we are taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees a dream, it is revelation, it is the truth. They have to act upon it and it is not false at all. Like you know, Ibrahim alayhi salam saw in his dream that he was sacrificing his son. That was considered an instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was revelation. So the same applies early when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to see a dream and then the following day it would be completely true. This was the early signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was purifying him and raising his level. Thereafter, he used to go into the Mount of Hira the cave of Hira, as we heard yesterday, northwest of Mecca. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us to Mecca time and again. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to refresh us and rejuvenate us so that we can worship him at all times, worship our maker and another, none other than the maker. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to see the dreams and there. go into the, this cave and meditate meditate in seclusion subhanallah he used to ponder over the condition of the people of Makkah and try and ponder over solutions number one number two is he used to worship Allah and praise Allah according to the teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and that was the monotheism the one Allah he used to praise the creator and the one whom he will return to and this was what he used to engage in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People might wonder, well, what worship did he engage in? He worshiped Allah alone. He never ever bowed to an idol, nor did he bow to people, nor did he engage in tawaf around the Kaaba whilst those idols were there. No, he did not. Meaning in the pre-Islamic time, he did not do it for the idols. But 
He did it for the pleasure of his maker, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him to do that. Also, we learned that some of the various creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to greet him. Like we spoke about the stone twice. This is the third time I'm mentioning it. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I know a, a stone or a rock in Mecca that used to actually greet me sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one day what happened is as he was in the, in the cave and this was the 21st day of Ramadan, the 21st night, in fact, the eve. Ramadan when he was 40 years old and suddenly in that cave appeared the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam obviously it was something different for him he was concerned he was worried to a great degree and Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam came to him and tells him iqara read first words revelation coming down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Revelation came down in several forms. One of them was this way, where Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he came and he instilled it into the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a way that it will never be forgotten. This is why today when you learn something in memory, they say this person learned it off by heart, which means solid placed in the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solidify the memorization that we have of the Quran. Every one of us have contributed in one way or another towards the preservation of the Quran by memorizing even if it means Surah Al-Fatiha. Today we read it so many times, I'm sure every one of us knows it off by heart. And if we don't, then there is something wrong with us being Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So we have all memorized a portion of the Quran, every single one of us without exception. Subhanallah. So this is the gift of Allah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's heart had within it the Quran placed by Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam by the will of Allah, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, 40 years old, that's not a child, he's old. And he was being told, read. So what happened? He said, Ma ana biqari. I'm, I can't read, I'm not a reader. He was unlettered. Remember Allah says, the bulk of them were unlettered. It is Allah who sent a messenger amongst the unlettered one from amongst them to them. So the bulk of them were unlettered. He was honest enough to say, I am unlettered. How many of us here would, be, would want to admit that we know nothing about technology at all? Imagine holding your mobile phone the other way around on your ear. Would anyone want to admit that we don't know how to operate this gadget? No matter what, I have actually seen people who read books the other way around. And it's only the photograph that makes them know that this is how you go to hold it. And even then they make mistakes and they're supposed to be rulers of the world at times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he make us from amongst those who realize and understand. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not a proud man. He was honest. He was dignified, straightforward, trustworthy, truthful. He says, Ma ana biqari. So Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam embraced him and hugged him tight until he was almost suffocating and then released him and told him again, Iqra. So he says, Ma ana biqari. I am not a reader. You're asking me to read. I am not a reader. So Jibreel alayhi salam, the archangel Gabriel, may peace be upon him, embraced him once again and hugged him tight until he almost suffocated and then released him again. And he says, Iqra for the third time. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the third time says, Ma ana biqari. He embraced him for the third time and released him. The verses were revealed. Iqara bismi rabbika ladaqo. Khalaqa al insana min alaqo. Iqara wa rabbuka al akramu alladhi allama bil qalam. Allama al insana ma lam ya'lam. Stop there. Subhanallah. Five verses. Revealed one time. What were they? Read. Read in the name of your Lord who has created. The term Lord is not the proper translation of Rabb because Rabb means the creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, the one in supreme control, absolute control of every aspect of every creature in creation. That is the term Rabbun used to refer to that deity. So Allah says, 
read in the name of your Rabb who has created. Created absolutely everything. But here, created what? Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Firstly, created absolutely everything, but he created man from a clot of blood. Khalaq al insana min alaq. He created man from a clot of blood. Now, some people look at the Quran and say, well, there is a contradiction because in one place Allah says created from dust, one place He says soil, one place He says clay, one place He says semen, one place He says a clot of blood, and so on. There is no contradiction. These are the different phases and stages in the creation of man. Initially, dust, soil, clay. Once the first human being was created, the second one was created from his rib. And once those two were created, the semen was used. When semen, and as you know, uh, when the zygote is formed and the embryo begins to grow, it's a clot of blood initially and thereafter it begins to gain form and so on. Subhanallah. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making mention of the different stages within the creation of man. No contradiction. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمُ Read and you should know that your Rabb is the most generous, Al-Akram, the most generous, the most honoring, Allahu Akbar. Allah has just honored him with prophethood. And Allah has honored and favored us all and humanity at large by granting them nubuwa. Imagine what love Allah had had for the people of Quraysh, for raising from their midst a Nabi, a precious jewel, a person who would come and change the whole globe, subhanallah. Imagine the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who were the household of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who accepted his message instantaneously, as we will see a little bit later. And this is why we say at that moment, what had happened on earth was something changing the entire earth. Allah blessed the inhabitants of the earth by sending Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time, the period of darkness where women were being oppressed from left to right, east to west, north to south, everywhere there were wars, there was feud, the order of the day. What was it? It was chaos, oppression. Those who were strong ruled, those who were weak were downtrodden. They were oppressed and enslaved at times. Free men were enslaved just because they were not recognized or they did not have a clan to protect them against the tyrants. And this is what was the order of the day. And if you take a look at the gift of Allah, these people were worshipping stones and sticks and idols and people and so many other things. And they had lots of superstition in them. What a blessed gift of Allah. Allah is sending a messenger from amongst them to say, worship your maker and your maker alone and do not associate partnership with your maker. Your Rabb, the one who taught by the pen. He taught man what man did not know. What man did not know. What did man know at the beginning? Nothing. As time is passing, Allah is allowing us to know more and more certain things we will never be able to explain, such as a dream. When you dream, what do you dream? How do you dream? They still have not developed a little flash stick that you can plug into your ear and choose to dream what you would like. That hasn't yet happened. Allahu Akbar. And I don't think it's coming. This is a gift of Allah. You dream, you can be dreaming of the best dream. The person next to you can be having the worst dream. The two of you will be one in peace and the other in torment. When you get up, subhanallah, neither can feel what happened to the other. That's a gift of Allah. Allah says, we taught man what he did not know. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think of his greatness. And Allah is telling us, And you have not been granted knowledge except but a little. Still, whatever you have is just a droplet. Subhanallah. A long time ago when people used to be told of how the angels write down everything you utter, and it is written and it will come on the day of Qiyamah and it will be weighed on the scales, literally weighing on the scales. People began to say, how will the books look? They will look like this and they will look like that. Today you have a 64 gigabyte little chip smaller than the size of my nail. And in it you can have 6,400 libraries full of books and still there will be space. Subhanallah. Look at this. And people used to say, how will that happen? Today when you talk, the computer registers, the iPhone registers. The Android device registers and people wonder how will these angels register? Allahu Akbar. Look, a few years ago it was not dreamt of that your phone will listen to your instruction. Today it's there. 
Today people speak to the doors. They tell the door to open, it opens with your voice. Anyone else's voice, it doesn't open. You come to the door, it recognizes you by your eye and it opens for you. It's happening. Where do you think you're going to run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his forces? That Rabb who gave us out of the little knowledge that we have, the understanding of so much, do you not think he is able to absolutely have the record of every droplet that has occurred from the beginning of time right to the end of time? Subhan Rabbi al-A'la. So Allah says, read in the name of your Rabb. We learn a lot from this and I need to pause for a moment. Firstly, the first words that were revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, read, the man is unlettered. We would not say uneducated because he was highly educated, but he was unlettered. And why unlettered? Allah kept it that way for a reason. Because the people of the book, a lot of them barely knew Arabic. And what had happened is, he did not know how to read the other languages. So amazingly, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has covered him. Nobody can say he read from those people. No one can say he sat and communicated with them. No, he was unlettered. This thing came, the whole universe acknowledges that this was an unlettered man. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to open our doors. Yet we, we can read every booklet. We still haven't read the main book. Think of it. He could not read, but he knew that book off by heart. We can read and write and we are proud and we send our children to school from an early age. We're so excited when they can say A to Z all the way at the age of three and two and we get so happy. But they still haven't read the Quran and they still don't know what the whole world is all about. And some of us are still guilty of that. Yet we are 40, 50, 60 years old. Not once did we read the meaning of the Quran. It happens. This is the weakness of man. And yet the first word to be revealed is Iqra. If you're not going to read the word of Allah, what are you going to read? So this is a challenge to you all and to myself. Read the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before your time is up. You are not going to have a response when Allah asks you, I reveal the word read. Did you read my word? What are we going to say? La ilaha illallah. There can be no more powerful a statement than that. Iqra, bismi rabbik, read in the name of Allah. When we start reading the Quran, A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. I seek the protection of Allah from shaytan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful. Then we start reading. We started in the name of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This also shows us that what seems impossible in this world, if we say the name of Allah, it becomes possible. It becomes easy for us. Allah facilitates it for us. And this is why there is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu amrin dhibadin lam yubtada ufihi bismillahi fahuwa aqta. Anything important that you start without the name of Allah, it is cut. Cut of blessings, cut of simplicity, cut of all forms of goodness. You won't achieve anything good. So whatever you are doing, get in the habit of saying bismillah. Because in this way, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was unlettered, he started and was instructed to start in the name of Allah to read. And Allah opened his doors with us. If we use the name of Allah, Allah opens the doors within our homes, within our businesses, within our families, within our societies, with our health, our wealth, absolutely every aspect of existence. Whatever you do, Bismillah, get into that habit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Another thing we need to know, nothing is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing. Miracles can happen, have happened, are happening and shall happen. Remember that. Nothing is impossible for Allah. So just continue praying to Allah. Whatever you want, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Make sure you are on the right page. Sometimes we are not only on the wrong page, we are in a different book and we're calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What this means is, our food is haram, our drink is haram, everything is haram. How are we going to get our dua responded? A person whose food is haram, drinking is haram, his entire diet is haram, everything he has consumed, his clothing, the works haram. Then he wants to say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, how does he expect the dua to be accepted? This is why when we are making dua, start off also by saying, Oh Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, I've committed sin. Those which I know, those which I don't. Those which I committed in secret, those which I committed openly. You forgive me. You know better than me what sins I have committed. Ya Allah, forgive me. Allahu Akbar. And this is why when it comes to sins and their effect, 
You need to know those who do not dress appropriately. They want to show their aura. They want to show their private parts, whether it be hair, whether it be legs, whether it be the chest or the cleavage, whether it be, you know, going right up to the top of your hand and so on. When a woman is supposed to be covered and a man is supposed to be covered, those who expose the ulama have said it is a sign that somewhere down the line they have consumed haram, either riba or either something that has earned the wrath of Allah that they have put into their mouth. Where did we get this from? فَأَكَلَا مِنْهَا فَبَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا Allahu Akbar. Adam and Hawa, when they ate haram, their shame was exposed. You find they now everything that was supposed to be covered began to become exposed. And the same happens to us now. Eat haram and you feel like uncovering your legs. And what happens? You want to uncover. You don't get peace unless your hair is opened. Something somewhere down the line is wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a turning point. I know what I have said is very heavy. But wallahi, sometimes we need a push before we can actually obey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write this for us and not against us. And may he make us from those whose hearts are softened when we hear something like this and not from amongst those whose hearts become even more hardened. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us by revealing these as the first verses. And here there are some secrets of the creation of man. How man was created. These people of Quraysh, they had no clue before how man was created. They did not know the beginning. They never believed in anything besides their idols and stones and so on. It was just the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians who were before, who had the correct knowledge of how man was created and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. So what happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that stage? Amazingly, he was now cold. He was worried in awe, we would say. He rushed down from the mount. Jibreel alayhi salam had disappeared. And this man rushes down. Where did he go? He went to the one whom he trusted the most at the time, his own beloved wife. How many of us, the most trustworthy to us are our wives? Don't worry if your answer is no. We ask the wives, why is the answer no? Allahu Akbar. So it's not only your fault, sometimes it's even her fault. Because remember nowadays, both of us need a lot of attention. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. When I say attention, I'm talking of panel beating. I'm not talking of attention as in, you know, giving someone as much attention as possible. No, that is there. But we require correction, both of us. No one party can say, no, she's wrong, I'm right. He's wrong, I'm right. No, it takes two. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and open our doors. With Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was such an upright man. When he ran down, he knew he could trust his wife. Today they say, you tell your wife something the whole dunya knows. I hope that's not the case with us. But they say, you want to spread news? It's email. Faster than email is female. Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us. I hope that's not true. But sometimes this is what goes on. When someone has entrusted you with a secret, you take it to the grave. Believe me, you take it to the grave. Look at the quality. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa rushing down. What does he say? He comes down and he is sweating. And he is now feeling cold. And he is now in awe. And he is shivering. And he is saying, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me, cover me. What has happened? His wife, beloved Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha, immediately covers him. And she says, what is happening? What is wrong? And he narrates what had happened. And she says, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abada. Nay, never. Allah will never ever let you down. Nothing bad can happen to you. You are such an upright man. You assist those in need. You fulfill your family ties, those and the orphans. You always are out helping people. You have such great character and conduct. And she began singing praise. Why singing praise? Because this man was indeed the one who was really as she was mentioning. With us, your wife tells you, oh, you're such a wonderful man. But inside she knows, I have to say this because I need something. It happens sometimes. If you ask her, you love me the most, she says, I love you the most. Inshallah, I hope it's the case. But sometimes she has to say it because what option does she have? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. With her, she was honest. This was a time of need. 
And she knew the man is upright. What has he ever done? He's been a person who's concerned. He worships not the idols. Never has he worshipped an idol. He didn't drink. His tongue was so clean. He never swore. He never spoke slang. May Allah protect us from slang. It reduces the value and respect of an individual when he speaks slang, no matter who it is. And that is in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We, including myself, we are guilty sometimes of what? Uttering a word or two of slang just to make it sound lighter and to bring it closer to the heart. We should try and avoid that. Speak clear language. And you don't need to speak so difficult language that people don't understand you. Speak in a way that everyone can comprehend and understand. Subhanallah. So she mentions so many of his good qualities and she says, don't worry, don't worry. As she is covering him, she then decides, let me do this man a favor by taking him to my cousin Waraka ibn Nawfal. He was a man who read and wrote. He was very well versed, highly educated. He was an alim, according to what we would say. Alim meaning he had knowledge of the deen and the religion. And he read the previous books and he had links with some of the people of the book. And so when Khadija binti Khuwaylid radiallahu anha took this man immediately, the husband, imagine, he was 40 years old. We said 21st of Ramadan. She was 55 years old, according to the bulk of the narrations. And what happened is, she's now taking her husband and going. They had had children, subhanallah. They had already had their children, subhanallah. And he's taking, she is taking him and going to Waraqah bin Nawfal. And when they went, she says, oh, my cousin, listen to my husband. What has happened to him? So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrates the story to Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa was a man who was awaiting prophethood. He knew that the prophet is about to come any minute now in this region. He was also one of them who was waiting. So when he was told, a man came to me, the angel came to me. And this is what happened. He revealed to me, Iqra. Who was the first person who heard the words of revelation? Besides Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hearing it straight from Jibreel alayhi salam, it was Khadija. Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha. She heard these verses. So she was the first human being to listen to verses of the Quran after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she took this man to Waraqa and Waraqa heard the verses and he says, no, that is definitely the angel that came to Moses and the angel that came to Jesus. May peace be upon them all. Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salatu was salam. That is the same angel, Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. And if this man is saying the truth, then very soon he will be sent to his people. And I wish I had had youth in me to be there the day that he will be driven away from his own people. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks and he is now confused. Are they going to boot me out, my people? He says, I wish I will be there the day your people kick you out. Your own clan, tribesmen, I wish I will be there that day. Now remember, this was just revelation. This was prophethood. Allah did not instruct him yet to go out and preach. No, that hadn't yet come. This was only prophethood. It was the beginning. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being calmed down by his wife. And Allah had placed her so strategically because she had had the qualities that were needed to really calm this man and to be a comfort and support for him at that particular time. No one but her would have done that. Look at how his business deals brought him to this woman and how this woman was also prepared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this particular purpose. Radiallahu anha. So what happened? He says, yes, anyone who has come with anything similar to what you have come with has been fought and fought heavily. Allahu Akbar. Anyone who has brought prophethood and people has been fought up to today. Nearly every society and community on the globe. Whenever there is a man who gets up and tells them as is, there are a few people who fight that man. Always. Nearly every, I hope we're taking out a few good societies from there. Nearly every community. When a man comes and warns people and tells them and gives them a bit of what we would term today, you know, a, a true word, a word of advice, subhanallah. People don't like it sometimes. You know, you get the haughty who don't want to be told. Sometimes you have in a masjid, they tell you, don't talk about interest here. 
Don't talk about music here. Don't talk about adultery here. Don't talk about illegitimate children here. What? I have come across this. I don't know if you have. Why would they do that? Because they have the clout and they're all involved in that type of misbehavior. They don't want to be told. When they come to the masjid, they want it to just be smooth, soothing to the ears. Come and listen to read salah, give zakah, go for hajj, do this, do that, and that's it. Don't even say be truthful. Stop lying. Stop eating interest. Don't even say that because you're going to trample the feet of those who are haughty. Allah protect us. This is the downfall of society. This is what happened. Waraka bin Nawfal says anyone who came with this message was fought by their own people. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us those who fight the messengers who come to us. Allahu Akbar. So here Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is told that you know what? A time will come when Jibreel will come again and he will give you revelation. And I wish I'm there. If I am alive, Waraka says, I will support you with full support, full backing of mine you will have. Sadly, a few days later, he passed away. Waraka bin Nawfal. Only Allah knows his position. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly where he is. There are some narrations which make, which make mention of his forgiveness and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treat him with his mercy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treat us all with his mercy. So this was Waraka bin Nawfal. So now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, him and his wife, subhanallah, Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha, she believed completely there was no question of a question. No need to ask because she knew what had gone on. So she was the first who actually believed. Now what had happened? There was a period of time, a few days, wherein revelation stopped. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go back and he would meditate once again some narrations say it was a very long period of time no the most correct narrations make mention of a 10 day gap 10 day gap meaning 21st of ramadan up to the first of shawwal now if you take a careful look he used to go every day and meditate in seclusion we are all encouraged to engage in ibadah and worship allah in seclusion as well and do you know what? Those particular 10 days are actually a sunnah to engage in i'tikaf. I'tikaf meaning you sit in seclusion in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pondering over your weakness, how you can correct yourself, how you can be improved and you worship Allah alone and you increase your tilawa, recitation of the Quran, understanding of it, your salah and so on. May Allah make us from those who can engage in this i'tikaf. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the 21st, the 22nd, the 23rd, he was waiting for revelation to come again as per what Waraka ibn Nawfal told him. And what happened? The revelation did not come. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was getting a bit worried. And then on the 1st of Shawwal, it is reported that that is when he was walking this hadith, his hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, which is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whilst I was walking, I looked up and I saw the angel Jibreel in his original form. You know what the original form is? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel many times, but most of the times he was in the form of a man, a very handsome man. And when he came in the form of a man, there were times when his companions have also seen him. Like the ones he came and he sat with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he was asking him some questions. And then when he went away, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say that we saw this man coming. He had white clothes, he had black hair. We, nobody knew him, which means he was not from anywhere near, but he looked like he had not undertaken any journey whatsoever. And he came in and he sat with his knees right in front of, with the knees of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, utmost respect. He's asking questions. When the answer comes, he says, yes, you are right. And they say, we were surprised. And he's asking, and he's also saying, you are right. Imagine someone asks you, how old are you? And you say 50. And he says, you're right. Allahu Akbar. He said, well, why did you ask me? Allahu Akbar. So when he went away, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, do you know who that was? They said, Allah and his messenger know best. That was Jibreel. He came to you to teach you your religion in the form of a Q&A. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us and may he grant us goodness. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, I looked up and I saw 
Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam, he covered the sky, the whole sky. In his original form, he was seen twice by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Once was on this occasion that we are talking about when the second set of verses were revealed. He had 600 wings, each wing from the east to the west. You cannot see where it starts and you cannot see where it ends. Subhanallah. Lahu sit to me ati janah. 600 wings, this angel Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam in his original form. The second time Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw him was Mi'raj. I'm sure we all are aware of the incident of the ascension into the heavens of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yes, on that occasion also he saw Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam in his original form. So when he saw this angel, he immediately was in awe once again and he was concerned again. He ran back to his home. And as he is running, asking for cover, the verses are then revealed into his heart. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhal muddathir Qum fa'anthir Wa rabbaka fa'kabbir Wa thiyabaka fa'tahhir Wa rujza fa'hjur Wa la tamnun tastakthir those are the verses. They came down. That was now an instruction. Let's go through the meaning of it. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. O you who is enveloped in garments. He was already enveloped in garments, covered in garments. Qum fa'andir. Get up and warn. So he was now instructed to deliver the message. Get up. And you know to get up means be brave. Get up. Don't worry. Allah is there. If someone tells you get up and walk or get up and tell the people it's much more stronger than a person who tells you just sit down and quietly just mention this stand up eloquence it is a message a powerful message get up and warn from this we know the sunnah when muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to deliver his sermons 90 percent of the time if not more he was standing unless there was a reason for him to sit he was standing so this is the sunnah. Qum fa'anthir. Get up and warn. Warn who? The people. Warn those. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then later on broadened the circle as we will come to see. Qum fa'anthir. Wa rabbaka fa'kabbir. And your Rabb, He is the one whom you should declare the greatness of nobody else. So we neither worship sticks, nor stones, nor idols, nothing, no takbir for anything besides Allah. Nothing, the greatest is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. So, Rabbaka fakabbir. As for your Rabb, what should you do? You should declare His praise and His praise alone. Wa thiyabaka fatahir. As for your clothing, you make sure that they are pure, clean, clean from any dirt, clean from any form of impurity. So, the clothing is clean and also presentable in the sense that when we want to give a message, we need to be presentable. Presentable according to what we have. Sometimes people may not have. There were times when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to wear clothing which had so many patches on it because that was the best he had. And there were times later on when he told people who had patches to go and get changed and to come back with clothing according to their financial standing. He told them, When Allah has blessed you, then the blessing of Allah should be visible on you. Thank Allah by using what He gave you. So those who now, and I have seen some brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide me, guide us all, who intentionally make patches and instead of, you know, just admitting that they're following styles and designs, they say it's a sunnah. Sunnah to have patches. No, it's a sunnah only when you cannot afford it and you, you have to have those patches. That was the only time that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had had patches. But when he could afford it, he did not have those patches. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us... So Allah is saying, ثِيَابَكَ فَطَاهِرْ وَالرُّجْزَ فَهْجُرْ Everything dirty, impure, leave it. Whether it is bad character, bad conduct, bad behavior, foul language, impurity in terms of worship, all that, chase it away. Be far away from, him, from that. وَلَا تَمْنُنْ تَسْتَكْثِرْ And do not go and brag about something you've done in order to try and get more or raise attention. Today, we do something small and then we want the whole world to know we did this. There are very few who will tell you, I don't want to be known. Allahu Akbar. 
and they will stick to that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Sometimes we do a small favor for someone, but the way we brag about it, they actually begin to feel that I hope that this man had not done me this favor because the bragging of it is far more valuable or far more, it has exceeded the value of the gift they actually have engaged in. May Allah protect us. This does not mean we should forget the goodness someone has done to us, but it does mean when we do good, we should forget it. Do it for the sake of Allah. In Surah Al-Dahr, Allah says, Indeed, we feed you for the sake of Allah. We don't want from you any recompense, nor do we want a thanks. We just will suffice with the reward that Allah has given us. May Allah make us from those who can suffice with the reward that Allah has given us. Remember, when we brag about things, we reduce the reward. And when we think, okay, it's me who did this. Some people come and say, you know who put you on your feet? It was me. It wasn't you, it was Allah. Because your feet and my feet are all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to know that. So never ever tell someone, you know, I'm the one who put you on the map. And I'm the one who did this. No, that map belongs to Allah. You and me, we all on that map if Allah wills. And we all off it if Allah wills. So it's Allah. Let's relate things to Allah. This is why in the Quran, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. O oh, you who believe, do not nullify the reward of your charities and your good deeds by bragging about it and by harming people after that. Be careful. Don't harm the people. Relax. Because if there is a nobleman, he will come up and he will pick up the fact that you are bragging and you are harming and he will disassociate himself from you in a very beautiful way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautify us. May he rectify our habits and may he make us from those who are humble. These are the first words of instruction to Allah, meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La tamnun tastakthir. Don't go bragging, don't go mentioning or seeking a bigger reward than what you have actually planted and bragging about things in a way that now you want so much because obviously all the goodness that was to come thereafter was from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has the full reward of the salah we read today. This sitting that we have today, everything I am doing, you are doing. He has the full reward. He doesn't need to brag about anything. Allah has given him Sayyidul Awwalina wal Akhirin. He is the leader of the, those who started and those who shall end. So he needs no bragging. Allahu Akbar. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is an honor for us to associate with him. So much so that whoever sends blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, the hadith says Allah will bless them and salute them tenfold. Subhanallah. And there is one narration that says when you send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa once, Allah sends blessings and salutations upon you tenfold and he removes ten of your sins and he raises you ten ranks and he adds ten rewards onto your scale. Subhanallah. صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه. May Allah subhanahu wa taala bless him and his household and all his companions. So Allah subhanahu wa taala then ends the first, or should I say, the second set of verses that were revealed. ولربك فصبر. And for the sake of your Rabb, bear patience. And already this was confirming what Waraka had said, Ibn Nawfal, that you will have to bear patience. If it was smooth, this verse wouldn't have been there. Because when you get up to deliver the goods, there is patience required. People won't listen. It's going to be difficult. You will have challenges. You will have people fighting you. You will have people from within and people from outside. Subhanallah. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by already informing him that look, you will need lots of patience. Get up, use the name of Allah stop, and warn the people. When this happened, he went down and he chose Allahu Akbar. He chose a method that was inspired to him also through revelation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was that method? For three years, he called people quietly. How did he call them quietly? He started off with those closest to him. None of them rejected. Amazing. Who was closest? His wife. She had already accepted. She was the first one who accepted. As we said, Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha. Amazing. She was the first to accept. 
And thereafter, who was next? Well, his cousin was a young boy in his own house because Abu Talib, who was his uncle, had many children and he couldn't really afford much in terms of food and drink. So they began to look after some of his children and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to take Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and to keep him with him. And he used to feed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and accompany him. And he was the first from amongst these young boys who accepted Islam. I accept this message. I believe indeed there is only one Allah. And it is reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu did not worship an idol. Why? Because he grew up with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He watched the man, the man with character, with conduct, no swear words. The temper was gone. He didn't have a temper like what we have today. He didn't scream and yell. No, what a role model. Immediately his wife accepted. This young boy accepted. Subhanallah. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. The narration say, the most correct narration say, he was 10 years old at the time. And thereafter, there was a young boy. We need to make mention of him. He was a slave who was freed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Zayd ibn Haritha. The only Sahabi whose name is in the Quran. Zayd ibn Haritha. He was a slave. And he was freed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day his parents came to buy him back from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We want to buy this young boy. And the young boy looks at his parents. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Look, I'm not going to stop you. You want to go. The father, the mother say, We're here to buy him. And he says, No, my parents. I'm going to stay here. They said, what? You are choosing to remain a slave with this particular man? He says, I have seen from this man that which I will never ever leave him for. Never. I've seen qualities in him that will make me remain with him forever and ever. That's it. And this was a young boy talking and he was a slave. Imagine the treatment of this young man, young boy. He was so loved by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The community used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd, the son of Muhammad, adopted son. Before adoption was prohibited later on in Islam. So adopted son took the name and they used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. These people accepted without batting an eyelid. Without batting an eyelid. Who else was there who accepted Islam? His daughters. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obviously, they knew their father. They loved him. He was their role model. He had no negative quality, not one negative quality. How many of us cannot even communicate with our own daughters, let alone instruct them? We can't even communicate. They are on a different page. Like I said moments ago, forget about different page. They are in another book altogether. Allahu Akbar. We first need to get them in the same book, then turn the pages until they come onto the right page. May Allah protect us. So where are we? Where is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Look, his daughters surrender completely. We believe that this man is a messenger. If he says he's a messenger, we know him best. This is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later in his life says, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi, wa ana khayrukum li ahlihi. The best from amongst you are those who are best to their families, starting with their wives and their children. And I want to tell you, I am the best to my families, he says. Subhanallah. And they bore witness. He was a man. He was a role model. Superb. Nothing wrong. Subhanallah. So his daughters accepted. Then there was a man. His best friend. What was his name? Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. For your information, that was just what he was known by. His name was Abdullah. And his father's name, they used to call him Ibn Abi Quhafa. So this man, Abu Quhafa, his name was Uthman. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his proper name is Abdullah ibn Uthman. We need to know that. We need to memorize it. According to us, Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe that the best who who stepped on the earth after the Anbiya, the most high in rank after the prophets to tread this earth was Abdullah ibn Uthman, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Remember that. The highest of all. After the prophets, his number comes next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless us all. So we need to know this man. Who was he? Allahu Akbar. He came down, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, met him and told him, you know Abu Bakr, 
this is what happened to me. And he mentioned, he says, immediately, he says, you are the most truthful. So I bear witness that indeed there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And you are the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Done. No questions asked, no batting eyelids. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says later on that whenever I invited people to Islam, every one of them took a little bit of a moment besides Abu Bakr. Immediately, he just surrendered. No even question, no movement, no nothing. These were the words. May Allah make us from those who can surrender. My beloved brothers and sisters, don't we want to join those companions in the Akhirah and in Jannah, in Paradise? Well, there is a way to do that. If we surrender to the instruction of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whether it suits us or not, we will automatically then become from amongst those who join those ranks. May Allah grant us those ranks, even though they seem distant, but from the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He can grant that to us. So this was Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He accepted Islam and thereafter he was an intelligent man, a wise man, well respected. He had, you know, very eloquent. He was very generous. He used to help people, very easy to talk to a, a good sociable man. And he was the best friend of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He also had very sound morals. He was also of very, very high standing in society. What he chose to do, this was all in silence. The message was being delivered personally, one by one. Yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had not yet got up to tell the people in public that oh people accept Islam. That happened the time later. As we said, this silent call to Islam lasted three years. It was known as a da'wah to Sirriya, the silent call. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu went to talk to some of his friends one by one. All of them accepted. Who were these friends? And who were these people? Uthman, subhanallah, ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He accepted readily. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu an, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an, Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiallahu an, Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu an. These were some of the people who had accepted with the effort of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. All he had to do was go to them and tell them, do you know, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is what happened to him. He's now a messenger of Allah and he is coming to us. What is he teaching? He's teaching good character, good conduct, worship Allah alone, no idols, no sticks, no stones. Re respect your parents, even if they are non-Muslim, meaning even if they are bad and they are engaging in shirk and so on. You don't listen to anything wherein there is transgress of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you obey the other instructions, you respect them and you honor your guests. You look after the rights of everyone. You don't cheat people, you don't steal. All this was brilliant. Because it was elevating their status even more. And they were also taught that there is a heaven, there is a hell. You are responsible for your deeds. You are answerable. You will be resurrected after you die. These were the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Exactly the same teachings as Jesus, may peace be upon him. Exactly the same teachings as Moses, may peace be upon him. Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Inshallah, tomorrow we will go into these early believers. What happened? What did they endure in the early days? And then how was the announcement made to Quraysh? And what happened as a result? Until we meet again with wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natu.